A very warm welcome to you brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the recording of CBN Lenten Retreat 2022 which was held on Saturday, 2nd April. The theme of the retreat is well-being at work and the retreat has been conducted by Father Francis Lim from the Society of Jesus. And so here is our program for the Day of Recollection. There will be an introduction by Father Francis followed by a small group sharing for 30 minutes checking in. After that you can take a short break followed by input session 1 which is time and effort for God. Then there will be 30 minutes of personal reflection and 45 minutes of small group sharing. After that you can take another break followed by input session 2 which is time and effort for myself. Followed by 30 minutes of personal reflection and 45 minutes of small group sharing. You can then conclude the day of recollection with a group prayer. Thank you and God bless. So, I am Francis Lim of the Society of Jesus. Actually, I'm Malaysian. Eh? I am sent here to Singapore. For the past 10 years, I was in a school in Kuching, Sarawak, as the principal. Uh, now, I'm missioned to Kingsmead Hall as the socius. Socius is a Latin word for assistant to the regional superior of the Jesuits in Malaysia and Singapore. And I'm grateful to CBN for inviting me to give this annual Lantern Recollection to all of you. And welcome. Now, I'd like to uh, emphasize that it is a day of personal prayer, if possible, to have silence. And when we have group sharings, it is for you in your groups of five to speak, to share the faith. And when we listen to others sharing, it is to gain support, to gain that communal sense of journeying together in our faith. When we hear of people's uh, joys and consolation, it gives us joy as well. When we hear of people's struggle and challenge in life, it helps us to identify our own challenge with them. So to listen attentively and to speak with intention are two main uh, points of a spiritual conversation, a group sharing. Uh, the title of our day here is Well-Being at Work. I suppose most of you are working and you have this uh, stress because of the pandemic. To have a well-being at work is to have a well-balance in life. Life and work goes together. Just like for us religious, the Jesuits, we always talk about life-mission. Our community, community life in the home is always tied closely to our mission as Jesuits in different places of the world. So balancing takes some effort and lots of practice. So we have to be patient with ourselves. We need to adjust ourselves. I will explain later what are the balancing in life, but the idea is about moderation and how we balance between all the different tensions of our life because it's very difficult to live at one extreme or the other extreme. The middle way is the most healthy way. The middle way, or some people call from other religions, say is the middle path that choose to balance ourselves between two extremes or the two really difficult parts of our life, we try to find the center point. Center point is a well-balanced life. So when we look within our own selves, these are the different aspects of the human person. Physical is our physical body. Health in the sense of how do we eat well, sleep well, and work well, and not only work, but also to exercise the body, to take care of our body. Together with the emotional, our feelings, uh, how we manage the feelings that we have within us. Some psychologists and spiritual masters will say feelings by themselves are very neutral. It's how when these feelings are put out or expressed that may hurt other people, 
or hurt our own selves. Feelings of joy are neutral by itself. Even feeling of being angry inside can be neutral. But when it's expressed in such a way that you know, somebody else gets the, the end of our anger, then that becomes negative. The feelings become negative. Then the intellectual and mental, uh, the, the, how, we say, the, how we know about ourselves, how we know about the world around us, how do we have skills, that is, and growth in this learning is part and parcel of who we are. The social is how do we interact with other people. Some people grew up in a very enclosed environment. They do not have that experience of interacting with others. And that skill, social skill, can be lacking, even though those people may be very, very smart. But lack of social skills. The spiritual is how we deal with the beyond. And for us Christians, it is God. And not only God, as Catholics, we believe that there is the communion of saints, those who have died, whether they are in heaven or in purgatory, we relate to them in a special sense as well. And of course, the most important saints of all would be Mary, our mother, a, woman, a womanly figure, a motherly figure that we can identify ourselves with. So all these different aspects of the human person, part and parcel of who we are, if we are able to balance them properly, then we become a well-balanced person when we have well-being as a whole person. So sometimes we are not aware of these different aspects that we need to balance in tension. If we overemphasize on a certain part of it, then we become unbalanced. And especially when we have children or grandchildren, when we bring them up, we have to consider all these aspects of the human person. And Catholic schools are supposed to do all these parts. We are not just to emphasize on the mental and intellectual capacity of the child when the child is growing up. School is not about forming the intellectual brain. It is also to let them learn about social interaction, physical health, enough sleep, exercise, eat well. And the spiritual, how to relate with God and the church, the emotional skills, right? the EQ that we talk about a lot nowadays. How do we manage our feelings in order to live a well-balanced lifestyle? So, this is like an introduction, but uh, it's for all people of different age groups. So if you look at this slide, we have the category of time, money, energy. When we are young, we have lots of time almost no money. <laughs> energy, lots of energy because they are young. In adult life, time less because most of the time you're working or busy with raising a family. Money, maybe we are trying to accumulate you know, to have some foundation for our children. Energy, yes, a little bit depleted from our young time, but still enough. But when we reach old age, we come back to a lot of time. And money, usually, if not CPF, right? CPF is a lot of money, right? <laughs> when you're old. <laughs> then the energy level goes down because of the physical makeup of our bodies. Time will make sure our body deteriorates over, over it. But today, as we come for this recollection, look at the extreme right. What about me now, at this moment? Today, what do I feel? Not necessarily about time, money or energy, but dealing with feelings as well. So this is within ourselves. I mentioned just now about the different aspects of the human person. Now, outside of us, we have relationships. And those relationships have to be right. Right in the sense that well-balanced. Not say right or wrong, but good, uh, middle path relationship, 
right relationship. And there are three, three uh, how I say, important partners in this relationship. And this has to be all well balanced. On top, you can see God. God is something beyond us. God is our creator and sustainer and redeemer. God, when we go through difficult times in life, we should depend on God. Because God is the Almighty. There are many things we cannot control in our own lives, even in the world around us, the natural world. We cannot control volcano eruption, earthquake, floods, maybe caused by humans or by nature. When we come to realize this, there are many things we cannot control. Then we realize God is the one in charge. Even the war in Ukraine now, some people cannot control it. But God, we have to ask God for help. We have to surrender ourselves to God. And then others, not only human beings, but also creation itself. The inanimate objects around us, whether it's rocks or the things that we made from our human hands, or the natural world in terms of plants and also animals. How do we relate to them? And of course, most importantly, the other human beings, especially those who are close to us in our lives, our loved ones, our family members, our workplace people. How do we relate with them? And the third one is my own self. How do I relate to my own self? Do I get in touch with my feelings? Do I, am I able to manage my emotions, my uh, mental capacity? You know, if we are not able to manage ourselves, very difficult to manage relationship with other people. So these three partners in relationships, there are three different kinds of relationship. And I'm talking about outside of us in the sense that how are we to balance ourselves in this uh, you know, live a good, well-balanced life. So to do this, whether well-balanced within us or with other people or God, we have to spend time and make the effort. You cannot be just sitting down there and say, everything will come to me. So we have to make that effort and time and also to have that determination of will. I want this. I want that. So that is what we want all of us to experience at this recollection today. Make that extra effort. You already make that time available for this whole day to, for this recollection. But during this recollection, try to make that effort to pray more, to share you know, honestly and with, from your heart. Thinking, thinking into account that the sharing within the group is private and confidential, right? to share honestly, so make that will, that determined will to do so. And not only during this recollection, every day of our lives, we have to make this continuous effort and to find time for God, for others, right? to make this choice of having a well, balanced lifestyle, a well-balanced mindset, a well-balanced life in that sense. So now, I want all of you go to your separate groups. You can find places outside or you even have three or four groups inside here to share about yourself in the sense that from where you're coming from, until this moment. Share briefly, what am I also expecting from this recollection? So it's like a checking in in that small group so that I come here is to, to let the others in my group know by vocalizing it. Somehow it helps to bring it out with another person. And in this case, it's a small group. Okay, so you can share a little bit about yourself if you don't know each other. What do you bring to this recollection? Maybe you have some joys, consolation, or maybe some challenges that you want to share a little bit. Then from there, share a little bit of what you 
want to expect from today? What do you hope to gain or benefit from today's recollection? Welcome back. After your sharing in your small group, I hope it has been helpful to hear each other, where each of you come from, your workplace, your home, what is your, also your expectation. All right. Now we are going to go into a retreat, sort of a recollection, to put ourselves in God's presence after hearing from the others where each of you have come from. Now we are here, sitting in this hall. We put ourselves in God's presence. And I have this song to lead us into this quiet time. So try to sit comfortably. Let's close, let's close our eyes, sit down comfortably, do not hold anything in your hand, put them on the floor. Let us be silent in the presence of God. Close our eyes. Whatever thoughts that come, 
may be a distraction. So we try to push these thoughts not away, but put them at our side, either left or right, and say to myself, I'm going to sit here in God's holy presence. Now, at this moment, things that happen just now, or whatever somebody said or do, is already in the past. These things, I leave them at the side. What I'm going to do next, or my anxiety that something is not yet done, something I need to do that's in the future, is not here yet. I don't have to worry about it now. So I also put those at the side. I want to focus me sitting down here on this chair in the present moment in God's holy place. I come into this recollection with a heart ready for God, a heart that wants to listen to God as I come to recollect myself during this day. Put yourself at this moment now and listen to the birds chirping as God's holy presence in nature. Pay attention to the sound of the birds. They are singing for God's greater glory. I'm sitting here at this moment in God's holy presence. Whatever thoughts that come, I put them on my left or on my right. I will attend to them later. Now, I am sitting in God's holy presence. The sound of rain is falling, but that is rain outside and on the roof of this hall. But I am sitting here on my chair in God's holy presence. You may slowly open your eyes. Okay, how was it with the sound of birds chirping? That was only two and a half minutes long. Imagine, <laughs> I don't know whether was it long or short. <laughs> Next, I'm going to lead you in a 10 minute silence. This, is, this time there's no birds chirping, it's just quiet. But then there will be sound of the aircon. There will be sound of noises from our neighbours sitting around us. But just say to myself always, 
I'm focused on myself, sitting here in God's holy presence. Whatever sound that is happening, okay, they are happening there at my side. I leave them there. At this moment, I'm just going to be here. And if there are thoughts that come, distractions, as I mentioned just now, things that I have to do, or after this, I have to plan for my lunch, or should I eat this or not, that one is in the future. They are not here yet. Leave them in the future. Just say to myself, I want to be here, sitting in God's holy presence. And if something that happened you know, just now, or whatever somebody said, oh, I remember that, that's in the past. It's already gone. You can do nothing about it anymore. Leave them in the past. Now I'm here, sitting in God's holy presence. I want to be silent before God, calm myself, let my heart slow down, and be in the dwell in God's presence. Okay? So can we do it for 10 minutes? It is not a meditation just because I want to have peace of mind, but it is a meditation with God. God is filling me with His Spirit. And that is a good way to start our recollection today. All right? Shall we try? 10 minutes. I'm going to keep the time. And I, at the, towards the end, I will slowly lead you out of that quiet. All right? So let us close our eyes. Sit down comfortably. Pay attention to the noise around us. The aircon. The rain. Feel myself sitting on my chair. The touch of the chair against my bottom. I'm here in God's presence. God is with me. The Spirit is filling me with His holy breath. I calm myself in God's presence. I'm aware of my breathing. Breathing out and breathing in. Imagine that I'm breathing in God's breath of life, filling me with freshness of the Spirit. At the same time, I'm breathing out whatever tensions that I have in my body and mind. I'm now in God's holy presence.
Thank you, God, for being here with me in my quiet time. Thank you. Thank you. You may slowly open your eyes. Okay, maybe you want to stand up for a while, do some stretching, because we have been sitting down in mobile for 10 minutes. Okay. Ah. Okay, if you want, you can sit down already. I hope it has been good. 10 minutes just to be silent with God, in God's presence. This is to get into the mood of the recollection and also uh, to get what it feels to be like in the silent retreat. If you fall asleep just now, okay, it means that your body is tired physically and you need to have some rest. But at the same time also, if you feel I'm refreshed now because of that silent time, then there is a connection between the body and the whole self getting in touch with God at the same time. So that is one aspect of how to be well balanced in life. Try to find some time each day to do this. Five minutes, ten minutes, we don't do, have to find an hour to do it. Or even in the home, when there are many people around, you just find a quiet space so that you are not disturbed by them. Even though the sound may be around us, it's okay. As long as we are quiet within our own hearts, we can do it. So this recollection is just a guide on how you can do this every day, almost every day. And over time, as you practice this with patience, it will help to make us more well-balanced in our life. Right? Good. Now I will lead you in a gospel reflection. We'll look at the gospel text. Later, during the personal time of prayer, you can use this for prayer. And I will do some kind of reflection on this uh, passage first. This is taken from Luke chapter 10. When the lawyer came and asked Jesus this question, he wanted to test Jesus, in fact. He asked, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do. So for him, it's something to do, to gain eternal life. Something that religiously we practice in order to achieve heaven. Sort of like, I do this thing, I get a reward. If I don't do this thing or do something bad, then there's a minus point somewhere. So he has this idea. Some of us may have this too. In order to get close to God, or even after we end our life on earth, to get to heaven, we have to do something now. Do something in the sense of practical doing. I mentioned just now about the will and determination, spending time and effort to do it. That is a determination, right? Each, it will be different from what this lawyer is asking Jesus. In his mind, he's doing practical things. But what I said earlier on today is different from this one. Yeah? I hope you understand that. We have to make that effort, spend the time in order to get close to God. So he, Jesus said to him in answer, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. 
That's the first part. Means our whole self, we are to love God. It's not just part of ourself that we love God. Heart, soul, strength, mind. In other words, it is the biblical, ancient biblical way of saying our whole self. Remember just now I mentioned about the different aspects of the human person? More or less, you can identify what I've said just now with this one. So he's, he's just basically saying that we love the Lord our God with our whole self, our whole balanced self. We don't love our God just at one aspect of our life more, using that aspect more than the rest. And the second part, of course, is your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. Do this. Practice it. So when Jesus is saying do this, it's not the same as the question that he asked, the lawyer asked. He thought of doing practical things to achieve eternal life. But Jesus is telling him, do this, practice this. Love the Lord your God and your neighbour as yourself. Practice it. So, is a orientation of the life of a person. It's not so much of doing things step by step or event by event, action by action. It's a mindset that we have. Now, if we look at the way the lawyer answered Jesus, is taken from Scripture. So he knows intellectually what it means to, to gain eternal life. But it's all intellectually. Whether he practices it with his whole self may not be. And also, uh, to gain eternal life, it seems that from some biblical scholar, nobody can gain eternal life just by themselves. It has to be from, with the help of God's grace. And that's why they do a lot of practices like sacrificing in the temple, go to the temple to pray. Because nobody can achieve eternal life by themselves. So they thought that by doing that, God will bring them to eternal life. Now, there are when the way we ans he answered this, there are three loves here. Love God, love neighbour, neighbour means everyone else, and the third love is love yourself. Because the second love, he said, love your neighbour as yourself. Or in some translation, love your neighbour as you love yourself. So we are able to love others only when we love ourselves. So that, I always call this the three-dimension love, 3D love. Love God, love others, love myself. And this love, this three love, has to be well-balanced. It cannot be skewed to one side. It means I love only God, I don't care so much about my neighbour. Yes, I love them a bit here and there, but I love only God. And then this, the, uh, disregard love for myself. So this three love has to be well balanced. If you look at the triangle just now, God above, others on one side, and myself on the other side. The triangle is connected by the sides of this three triangle. This triangle is a same-sided triangle. All the three sides are the same length. So we love God, we love ourselves, we love others equally, well balancedly, and that is how Jesus is saying, "You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live." So, to experience this love is like we are also cared by the care is shown by God when I care for myself in order to better care for others, and when I reach out to God. In order for God to take care of me, I am also at the same time taken care of by God. So care and love, well balanced between the three partners. As we look into the 
same gospel, the same passage, this lawyer desiring to justify himself because he's not satisfied with the answer of Jesus because Jesus is talking about practice this, this love. He wanted to seek clarification. So he asked, who is my neighbor? And this is when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the Good Samaritan is a well-known parable, which I'm going to reflect with you here now. But the Good Samaritan parable came about because of that three-dimensional love that Jesus answered. I mean, this lawyer came to ask him. So let's look at this parable. You are well, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. But uh, the early church fathers, when they write reflection on this parable, one of the ways to look at this parable is using the idea of allegory. Allegory is a well-known church interpretation of the scriptures in the early days of the church. Allegory means when we look at a scripture passage, there is a hidden message behind. Hidden in the sense that a deeper meaning. And that meaning is not absolute. Huh? It's not the only meaning. But these fathers are suggesting for this parable one meaning. And it's, of course, wider than that. But it's a good way to lead us into our contemplation today. So this allegory that I'm going to share with you concerning this parable of the Good Samaritan is like this. We imagine ourselves as the one who fell among the robbers, the one who was robbed. Usually we are asked, are we like the priest or the Levite or even the Good Samaritan? Hardly people ask us to reflect about being the person who was robbed and injured by the robbers. Now, the early church, they look at this person, the one who fell among robbers, as human beings in general. All fallen men and women and children. And Jesus is the Good Samaritan. This parable about the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jerusalem, in geographical sense, is located higher than Jericho at sea level. So Jerusalem represents heaven. Jericho represents the world. And Jericho is lower than Jerusalem. In, others, in that sense, the world is lower than heaven. And man, if I use the man in terms of uh, humanity, but more so because of Adam, the first man who fell, he fell because of his disobedience to God. So he fell from heaven to earth in that sense, in the garden when he disobeyed God. Now, as we look at this parable, I'm going to continue with it. So imagine ourselves as the man who fell into, among the robbers, every other person on earth. Then the robbers will be the invisible powers, the, the, the evil powers of is happening around us that lured the first Adam to sin. So in our own lives too, God made us all God's children. But because of our weakness as human beings, we will be tempted to do bad things or even to you know, fall into sin. Therefore, to be robbed of our righteousness as God's children can happen when we sin. So these robbers stripped the man, beat him up and left, departed, leaving him half dead. So sometimes we feel that too, we are half dead because of what we go through in our lives, not only because of sin, but because of the challenges that can be very burdensome, too heavy to bear. So we are like half dead in our journey as we move in our life. As we continue with the passage, the parable, 
Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So the priest and the Levite, if we want to look at scripture, I mean, those people are, the priest is serving in the temple in Jerusalem. The Levite is part of the temple people. So probably they were going to serve in the temple. And they don't want to defile themselves by touching a corpse. So they thought this man on the roadside could be dead. So they don't want to go near that person because they, in that way they'll be unclean. So that's one way of looking at it. But the allegory of uh, the early church fathers is that the priests represent the law, the Levites represent the prophets. So if you know, the Old Testament is made up of two bout of writings, sacred writings. The law, given by, to Moses, then later on, the prophets, different prophets wrote down writings for people to, to have a holy scripture, to have the sense of God. So to these two parts of the Old Testament are not helpful, according to the early church fathers, huh, are not helpful to this man, to all of us who are on the road to gain eternal life. This just different interpretation huh, and it's up to us to find meaning in this way of looking at the parable. There's no absolute way of looking at the parable. But a Samaritan. Samaritan are people who are at odds with the Jewish people. So they are not friends. They are enemies because they don't belong to the same tribe. So Jesus purposely put somebody who is not part of the Jewish nation to come and help this man fell among the robbers. So a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. As I mentioned just now, the Samaritan, according to the allegory of the early church fathers, is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. He came to save fallen man. Now, compassion. He had compassion. God has compassion upon people who disobeyed God. Even though they turned away from him, God still cares for them. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. So, allegory of the church father says, bandages are the church teachings. Oil the Holy Spirit's anointing. Wine, the Eucharist. The wounds are disobedience. So when this man bound, bandage, bandages this poor man, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So the allegory of the church father says, the beast of burden, the donkey, could, is the body of Christ. The body, of the body of Christ carries the disobedience of people. The inn, which takes in everyone, regardless of whom, even the injured, is the church. So Pope Francis recently, a few years ago, he has mentioned that the church is like a field hospital who takes in the wounded. The church cannot be just an institution of so-called holiness, and don't accept people of different kinds. The church is there to tend to the wounds of people, the suffering of people. So in that sense, the church has to go to the ground and be in touch with the people. And the next day, he took out two denarii, which is a denarii is a day's wage, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, innkeeper would be the people in charge of the church, right? the, the clergy or religious or even leaders of the church, not necessarily clergy. Some people say the two denarii are the, the sacraments, the most important sacrament, confession and Eucharist. 
saying to the innkeeper, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Jesus will come back. So Jesus entrusted the care of humanity to the church, giving the sacraments to the church in order to nourish the injured person to get, become well, to recover. So this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. I share with you the way to look at it using the allegory of the early church fathers. And imagine ourselves as the one who fell among the robbers. And Jesus ends this parable by asking the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Now this lawyer is a Jew. He does not like the Samaritans. So he cannot even say the name Samaritan. So he said, the one who showed him mercy. In a way, it's good because he is saying that the, the, the action or the mindset of this Samaritan is the one who is the neighbor. Regardless of whatever background the person is, whether Samaritan or Jew, And Jesus said to him, go, you go and do likewise. So do here, meaning to say our mindset, our concept of looking at things has to flow into action. So we have to show mercy. And showing mercy is not just having sympathy. Oh, I kasihan you, kasihan you, know, right? I pity you, uh, oh, you are like that. But to do something about it. So go and do likewise. It's also saying to us, go and be like Jesus, the, the good Samaritan. Jesus, as I mentioned, using the allegory, the Samaritan is Jesus. So you go and do likewise. Go and be like Jesus. Okay, so I've shared with you uh, this gospel passage of the parable of the good Samaritan. Later on, you use this for your personal prayer and see how I am taken care of by God. But I also need to spend some time and effort to experience this care. I cannot just go through life disregarding God, forget about God. Only once in a while I remember God when I go to church, when I receive the sacraments, when I read the Bible for a while. But it's a mindset or an orientation of our lives that we want to be well balanced with God in our workplace, full of challenges, in our family life, yes. But as I mentioned just now, just now well-being is the same as to be well balanced in our life. And we have to include God in this. All right? So now I'm going to share with you a, a poem written by this guy called John Newton about the Good Samaritan. John Newton used to be the pilot of a ship that traded slaves in this 19th century. And he's well known because he wrote the song Amazing Grace. He repented after realizing that what he's doing is very bad because they are promoting slavery and treating people badly, sold as slaves. Now, the way he wrote this poem of the Good Samaritan is like, we are the men who fell among the robbers. So as we read this, try to put ourselves in the shoes of this man who was robbed. Okay, I'm going to read to you slowly. And using this poem and the gospel of the parable of the Good Samaritan, these are the materials you can use for your personal prayer afterwards for half an hour. All right? So let's uh, look at the screen as I read to you. Put ourselves in the shoes of the man who fell among robbers. How kind the Good Samaritan to him who fell among the thieves, thus Jesus pities 
fallen man and heals the wounds the soul receives. Oh, I remember well the day when sorely wounded, nearly slain, like that poor man I bleeding lay and groaned for help but groan in vain. Men saw me in this helpless case and passed without compassion by. Each neighbour turned away his face, unmoved by my mournful cry. But he whose name had been my scorn, as Jews, Samaritans despised, came when he saw me thus forlorn, with love and pity in his eyes. Gently he raised me from the ground, pressed me to lean upon his arm, and into every gaping wound he poured his own or healing balm. Onto his church my steps he led, the house prepared for sinners lost, gave charge I should be clothed and fed, and took upon him all the cost. Thus safe from death, from want secured, I wait till he again shall come, when I shall be completely cured, and take me to his heavenly home. There, through eternal boundless days, when nature's will no longer rose, how shall I love, adore, and praise this good Samaritan to souls? So let's spend some quiet time looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan and the poem that I shared with you. Talk to God, pray, and see what God wants to tell you with this parable of the Good Samaritan. So you will go for your private prayer time for about half an hour, and then you will go into your small groups again to share the thoughts of your prayer, what struck you during the prayer. Now this conversation, this group sharing that you have, is a spiritual conversation. So share from your heart and know that the sharing is private and confidential. So when you speak and when you share, speak intentionally. So focus on what you're going to say. No need to go here and there everywhere. Focus what you're sharing is from your prayer just now. Then the rest, take turns to share, the rest listen attentively. Listen attentively. Now, I want you to have two rounds of this spiritual conversation, meaning the first round is each one take turn to share your prayer experience. And everybody else listen attentively. The second, and when the first round, everybody has shared, keep quiet for a while. Start the second round. Second round is to share what you heard from the others during the first round. What struck you? What made an impression in you from the sharing of others? So there are two rounds in this spiritual conversation. The first round, when somebody has shared, then the next person sharing for the first time in the first round, you don't have to say what the other person shared just now or what struck you. You do that in the second round. So each one in the first round, share your own prayer experience without saying what the previous person has said. So keep it very clear. The first round is each one share about your own prayer experience. Then keep a moment of silence. The second round, you only begin the second round, each one say something that has struck you from the other person sharing. So make sure these two rounds are clear and distinct. Usually the second round is shorter. Usually it should be shorter because you only share what you heard from the others. You don't add, don't add some more, you know? You, you already said what you want to say in the first round. Okay, so keep to that clear distinction between the first round and the second round. Hopefully, by this kind of sharing, it's called a spiritual conversation. 
you are able to gain a lot of benefit from each other and to have the sharing more focused. So today, this morning, we have been uh, uh, hearing and also praying about well-balance in life in order to be well, have a good well-being in, at work. And it deals with our connection with God, how we can be taken care of by God. Now it's more of how do we take care of ourselves, the human balance. The previously was the spiritual balance where God is, plays a very big part of our lives. So self-care is very important because self-care is connected and integrated with overall care, especially for our own person in relationship with God and others. If we are not able to care for ourselves, we will not be able to care for others as well. So the three love, the three dimension love, Love of God, love of our neighbour, and love of myself. They are very closely linked and connected. So therefore, uh, I would like to, in this half an hour, to talk about self-care and in connection with scripture as well. So in our working life or family life, in whatever life we have, there's the part about leisure, Leisure and pleasure. Leisure talks about time. Leisure is time taken off from work or other duties. It essentially means free time. This is the time when we are not doing anything that is regular. So we need to find leisure in order to rest and to take care of ourselves. On the other hand, we have pleasure. Pleasure is more of a state of being, something that gives us happiness or consolation. So in our leisure time, sometimes we might do activities that may not necessarily give us pleasure. For example, uh, exercise in order to lose weight. People don't, don't enjoy that, but they want to get a, a, a healthy figure, a, a nice figure and also a healthy life. And that, for that, we have to sacrifice. We have to endure pain. So people do that during their leisure time. Unless, of course, you don't think of it as a leisure time, like a suffering time. <laughs> so when we look at our uh, life, whether it's work or duties that we do, well, some of us may be taking care of our family, and that can be considered work as well. Full-time work, 24-hour work. We have this uh, two grade, two uh, axis. Pleasure, if you want to see it as something that gives us happiness, is more extrinsic, uh, something that we get from outside. The other axis is satisfaction or fulfillment, is more intrinsic. So if we look at the, we can reflect on this using the these two axes that I'm going to share with you, you. Uh, the extrinsic level, we have the positive and the negative. Huh? The more positive it is, means we gain more pleasure or extrinsic, extrinsic value from it. For some people, it could be finance. A higher paying job gives me more pleasure. Uh, it gives me more uh, extrinsic value, value that comes in from outside. Whereas satisfaction or fulfilling axis, the top and bottom, is more of what is inside of us. Whether this job or work that I'm doing, does it give meaning? So there's also positive when it's higher at the meaning level and below is negative. So I have four quadrants here. What if a job or a duty that I'm doing is low on the pleasure level, that is on the extrinsic level, and also low on the intrinsic level. We call it a chore. Children, we ask them to do house chores or force them to do house chores. 
They will say, I don't want to. It's so boring. Because extrinsically, it's not giving them anything. You're not paying them for their job. <laughs> it's part of their duty as children in the house, for example, to clean the house or to take care of their rooms. And on the other hand, there's no meaning for them because they feel that it's a real chore. They are forced to do it. They don't get any intrinsic value in it. So sometimes our work can be like that. So this is chore, huh? the first C. The second C is career. When the financial value of the job that we are doing is high, we get paid very highly for it. But then when we do the job, we find there's no intrinsic value. I'm not satisfied. I don't find fulfillment, even though the pay is high. So that's the second C, career. The third C, some jobs are not high paying, but it gives a lot of intrinsic fulfillment. And this we call a cause. Just use the image of an NGO worker, a social worker. They may not get paid very well because you know, everything depends on charity. But the person would love to serve the poor, for example, or to help those who are in counselling. But then it could be a government job and there's not much uh, finance value in it. So it is a cause because we are fighting, sort of fighting for a cause, justice or even help the migrant workers, or help those who are poor. This is a third C, we call it a cause. So the fourth quadrant, when we have high financial value and also high satisfaction, what do you think it is? Another C, <laughs> which is not easy to get, not common, and in a way, you can be lucky to have it. It's called a call. Something that just, we get it, and we find great fulfillment, and at the same time, a financial value in it. It may not be financial value, right? it could be something that gives us pleasure, something extrinsic. So both intrinsic and extrinsic value that is high, the thing that we are doing, the job that we are doing, the job can be a call. Is there such a job? I'm not sure. <laughs> Is there such a job? Yeah. Well, anyway, there's a fifth C. <laughs> People who move from job to job because they are not satisfied in this area, not satisfied in that area, of course, it's okay to cruise until you find something that gives us high intrinsic value and extrinsic value. People cruise around. Now, these five Cs that I show you today, based on the axis of intrinsic value and extrinsic value, doesn't mean that we are fixed in that stage all the time. Over our life span of time on Earth, we can move between all these five Cs different stages of our life, different levels of satisfaction and different levels of pleasure may come. And we can alternate between these different categories. So another thing that we can consider also is the extrinsic value merely the work environment. It could be the colleagues. People work together well. Is it an extrinsic value or an intrinsic value? or to th think of the bigger picture for the good of the company, for instance. Does it mean that it's an extrinsic value or an intrinsic value? So there can be uh, unsure uncertainty about this. For certain people, extrinsic value can be different from intrinsic value. For example, the good of the company, let's say, I work hard because I want the company to success, succeed. For somebody, it's an extrinsic value. For others, it may be intrinsic. Or the ability to work together in the, as a team, a team worker. Is it intrinsic or extrinsic? 
That is something I feel is very grey. It depends on who you are and how you view it. So these five C's can change quite easily for different people. So to have good self-care is to be aware of myself, the situation of life that I'm in now, where am I, and also what gives me satisfaction and meaning. At the same time, also what helps me towards it, that is the extrinsic value. So I'm not presenting a very clear line, but is to draw out this picture and you yourself look where you are. So to understand better, how can I care for myself? Remember, to care for myself is very important so that I am able to care for others. At the same time, to be cared by God. So the right relationship of God, others and myself comes to mind. These right relationships are interconnected. Okay? So now I will use scripture to emphasize what it means by self-care. We have an example here from the book of Exodus, chapter 18. I'm sure as Catholics, most of you did not bring your Bible. <laughs> it's the whole of chapter 18. I'm just joking. Yeah? It's the whole of chapter 18. I did not put it on the slide because it's very long, but I will tell you the story of what happened there. Moses, the basic thing is Moses receiving advice from Jethro, his father-in-law. This uh, story happened after the Israelites came out of Egypt, led by Moses. They have went through the Red Sea, they have gone into the desert, but this is before they went to Mount Horeb, where Moses received the tablets of the Ten Commandments. So they, you remember Jethro is his wife's father, and Jethro is quite a rich person in the sense that he owns a lot of cattle, and he lives in the wilderness, in the camps. So on the way from Egypt to the Promised Land, they were wandering in the desert. Somehow today, in this chapter, Moses met Jethro, his father-in-law. So I read chapter 18 for you slowly. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro took her back. Now, we do not know why uh, Moses uh, let his wife stay with the father, along with her two sons. The name of one was Jerusalem, for he said, I have been made an alien in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliza, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Okay. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came into the wilderness where Moses was encamped at the mountain of God, bringing Moses' sons and wife to him. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, I am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed down and kissed him. Each asked after the other's welfare, and they went into the tent. So they had a, they had a greeting. Then Moses told his father-in-law that all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had beset them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in delivering them from the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because he delivered the people from Egyptians when they dealt arrogantly with them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of the Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. 
So they had a fellowship. The next day, Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. So it's like Moses is the new leader of these people of Israel, and he has to do many things. He has to be judge as well. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? With all the people stand around you from morning until evening. Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people came to me to inquire of God. So in a way, Moses is like a mediator between God and the people. And Moses is also a judge to handle their grievances. He was the leader. And Moses continued to say, When they had a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out both you and these people with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and the instructions and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. You should be able, you should also look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you but decide every minor case themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will, burden better, they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times, hard cases they brought to Moses. And, and, but any minor case, they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart and he went off to his own country. So this is a reading from uh, Exodus 18, where we heard how Moses was overburdened with the care of the people of Israel. And Jethro, his father-in-law, gave him this advice. You cannot do it alone. You cannot bear the burden alone. It's too heavy to bear. Then what did uh, Jethro suggest? Delegate your workload. In order to delegate the workload, you should be able to trust people. Trust. And the other one is to work together. So self-care, this is a story from the Old Testament. How do we take care of ourselves when we are so, so many things to do, right? So this is a very good advice if in the family, for example, one parent is doing everything, then both parents have to do it together. And they have to trust and communicate with each other in, in communication with children. So trust is very, very important in working together. So I'm sure you understand the concept, just that how, how to do it. We cannot find our people, a lot of people complain to me. I cannot find people whom I can trust. You know, this person may not know how to do it. 
or he doesn't know and therefore I could not leave everything to him. It's very sad if we think that way but to build people together is to empower them as well, right? Empower them. So delegate workload, trust in people and then work together. So this is a lesson that we can learn from Exodus chapter 18. This is to help us to care for others and to care for ourselves, the most important thing. Okay, so this is from Exodus, Exodus chapter 18. The next passage I would like to share with you is from Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. It goes like this, But now even more, the report about him, that is about Jesus, went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So Jesus also needs to take time off from the busyness that he is doing in his ministry. So this self-care is an example from Jesus himself. Withdraw or retreat. The word retreat is to step back, spend some time and energy to care for myself. Remember, this care for myself is not merely inward-looking, it is in connection with God and with others. Remember the triangle? God at the top, myself and others, the other two uh, ends of the triangle. So quiet places, quiet physical places are important for this withdrawal or retreat. But then if we cannot find it in our daily schedule, then the quiet personal space is important. Just like what we did earlier this morning. We can be here all together. There are many people sitting around. The rain came and then we can hear some traffic outside. Afterwards, there are more catechism children coming in. The afternoon session is more people. So you can hear later a lot of cars, a lot of children. But then, that is the external, right? If we can create a personal space within us, the quiet space inside of us is a good opportunity to withdraw or to retreat from the busyness of our life. So, it's not going to be easy. As I mentioned, it takes some effort and practice. So in the home, or even in the office, where there's, it could be lunchtime when people are eating. So is, you, I think we are able to find some personal space. Just sit down and be quiet, even though all around us, there are many, many things happening, but that personal space can be within ourselves. You can try it. That's what we did this morning. Of course, the external uh, things that are around us can contribute or help in us finding that personal space. But if really, really cannot, I have even suggested to people when we travel to work, if we take public transport, I heard some people really take oh, some even 45 minutes on the, in the transport. Or if you drive, you can be alone in the car. That would be a good time for personal space. When I travel in the MRT, I, I, I don't look at my phone. So I look at people. <laughs> Out of 10 people, 9 are on the phones. So as if, I do not know, our life now, it must always be filled with something something to do, something to see, something to listen to. We cannot just sit down there, in spite of the busyness around us, to have that personal space inside. When I go into the MRT, I'll just stand or sit down, and I don't close my eyes. It's not, it's not helpful because people think you're sleeping or whatever you're doing. Right? Just observe lah, what's happening around me. That will be a time of quiet, I can pray for them, ask God to bless this person 
or maybe he's reading the newspaper to his phone, he's looking at a video, pray for him, for him and his family, or to observe that God is actively present in people around me. So this Ignatian way of examining our life each day, to be conscious of God, God is everywhere. We can find God in all things. So the practice of doing it often will help us to have that personal space with God and also with others. Okay, so I talk about withdraw, retreat to desolate places and pray, but then that can be done within our own personal space. The next one is this passage from Gospel of Mark chapter 6. Example, an example of self-care of Jesus and his disciples. So we look at this story. The, Jesus sent the apostles out to preach and to cure the sick, and now they came back. They must be very tired. So look at this passage. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. So he asked them, like what he did before, to withdraw, to pray at a desolate place, to rest. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat, leisure time to stop and rest and eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion on them. His intention was to go and rest with his disciples. But when the reality strikes, these people were like sheep without shepherd. Jesus had great compassion on them. Sometimes also we have the intention to go and rest, to take care of ourselves, which is very good. But then certain things need an urgent uh, address. So what happened to Jesus? He began to teach them many things. So he did something for them. For us, we have to discern, right? What is the thing that needs to be done? What that is the need for us to... Well, how do we need to rest? Remember that Jesus is also God. And he came to bring good news to those who are suffering. So he had great compassion and he reached out to them, even though he is very tired. So towards the end of today's this passage, when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. So there follows the story of the multiplication of the loaves of bread. I'm not saying that you know, when we make decision to care for ourselves, when the greater need comes, then we, like Jesus, go and help those who are in need. You know, just showing the example that this self-care is also in relationship with care for others. But still we have to care for ourselves no matter what. If not, as I mentioned just now, if we are tired, we cannot care for ourselves, how are we going to care for others? But this is just an example that, to show that this three relationship with God, myself and others should be in well balance. And this example of Jesus is because he had great compassion for others. I always tell people, you know, when people come, uh, you know, there was one time when I was studying theology, we were talking about you know, uh, confess, a person come to confess sins, then keep on saying that I want to help people, but I cannot, and I'm so tired about it. I have great 
desire to help others. I want to do this, I want to do that. Then at one point, people in discussion were saying, we can always say to that person, yes, you want to do a lot of things, but you are not Jesus Christ. You are not the saviour of the world. And you are not here to save the world. Jesus already did it. We are just here to work with Jesus the way that we can and then to put forward his kingdom. So what I'm saying here is, yes, we do care for ourselves, but we have to look at the bigger picture. Sometimes there is a greater need of people around us. Okay, we have to discern. Do we put their care first before ours? So different times, different situations demands a different set of response. Each of us have to make that dis discernment and decision. I cannot tell you, you know, when to help people and when not to help people, when to take care of yourself or when not to take care of yourself. It's up to you at your situation where you are. Right? I won't know your situation. So you have to discern and decide on your own. All right. So looking at these three passages that I gave you just now, this is the one where the needs of others came into play and then Jesus had compassion on them. This is the one where he wanted his disciples to rest, or he himself wanted to rest, and he's able to go and have pray, to pray. And the other one is Moses receiving advice from Jethro, his father-in-law, about delegation of work, trusting in people, and work together with others. We cannot carry the burden alone. So three passages from Scripture to help us to pray. And now let us go to a personal quiet time to reflect on these passages that I've shared with you and the thoughts that I've shared with you about the five different kinds of C, career, chore, course, call, cruise, See whatever touch you as you speak to God intimately about the situation in your current life, about how to take care of myself so that I can take care of others and also to be cared at the same time by God. Okay. Okay, so for again, uh, CBN is not a funded organization. We bring all our programs and services, uh, FOC, to, to you all. So do help us with your love offerings, uh, if you can. Uh, we'll, keep up, we'll keep the QR code. Uh, if you can open up your banking app and scan to pay, please. You can also send us checks or do a bank transfer. Dear friends of CBN, if you found this video helpful, please click the like button. And if you're new to our channel, do follow us on all our social media platforms and click on the subscribe button and the bell icon to get a notification whenever we post a new video. Thank you and God bless.